Good morning. My name's Uri Schneider. You'll notice that my guest is not here yet. He's finishing his previous meeting, but I figured I would do a little introduction even before he gets here because his bio is kind of long, but uh, it's a big treat. My name is Uri Schneider from Schneider's Speech, hosting a conversation with my good friend, Dr. Gerald McGuire. Um, we're gonna have the privilege to talk to the person who is the most eminent leading uh, researcher, practitioner, and connector in the space of looking at uh, psych, you know, pharmacology and solutions for treating stuttering in ways that are different than the ways that have been traditionally done. And here he just popped on. Jerry, I started it live. Just, I figured I would start your intro. It's fine. I figured it's a long hey, intro. You got it, Uri. How are you, my friend? I am well. Uh, I hope you're, you're well, good. Hey, yeah, hey, good. And I am in the, my uh, AirPods Pro here, noise canceling. What do you think of that high tech? Right? I, I, I'm, I'm the antithesis of the AirPods. I go with the Jabra, the Jabra 60. Oh, there you go, huh? You, you do. That is but, wonderful. Yeah, the good. next ones are coming out. I was nervous, Jerry, that if I did that, I would like on the airplane or something, I'd put my shirt on and they'd get flicked out and go through like the sewers. You're absolutely right. You know what? This happened to me. I should have talked to you before I invested in my uh, wireless earbuds, man. An unsolicited plug. I have no interest. <laughs> Full disclosure. But Jabra on October, mid-October, they're coming out with the 85T, which is the third generation. I have yeah. a 65T. If you want to save yourself some money, get the old version. They are unbelievable. I've had them for two years through flights. Wonderful. Running, getting dressed in my bedroom. They fall. They almost got run over by a bus. They're very strong. Awesome. A friend of mine posted with the <laughs> yeah. AirPods. The AirPods, yeah. not to take everyone's time, not like Jerry's busy, but <laughs> he was munching on nuts at his desk yeah. and he had his AirPods. He took them out and and then he had only one AirPod because he actually popped it in his mouth and crunched on it. So don't put your AirPods down when you're crunching on nuts. Hey, thanks, Uri. Okay. Great, great meeting you. Um, thank you. Awesome to have you here. We've got, we've thank got a you. couple, a couple, more than a couple people on, on board hey, here. Hey, guys, thank you. This is great. So Jerry is the Chair of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at the University of California Riverside School of Medicine. He is also a Distinguished Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, and he is the chair of the National Stuttering Association. He is also the past vice chair of the International Stuttering Association. He's been listed among the best doctors in America. I won't go on, but I did say that you are the address for very forward thinking ways of looking at new thoughts and thinking and research on stuttering. Of course, uh, looking at the uh, pharmacological opportunities or ways we can enhance treatment of stuttering. People have lots of questions about that. Um, I will facilitate that, nobody's gonna interrupt. But uh, the other thing is, Jerry, I just want to acknowledge, you look less of Jerry than you did the last time I saw you. You're, you're looking good. Let me tell you why. It's all the theory here, right, and beyond, okay. right? I'm just gonna go with it, right? Our, currently, a lot of our agents that we've studied and used in stuttering can lead to weight gain. I'm just going to be honest with you, right? A lot of them, the ones we've studied in the past, that's published, olanzapine, risperidone, all those, right? I think I have it solved. That's all I'm telling you, right? So let's just say in May, right? Uh, made a little switch, but under my doctor, right? I don't prescribe myself. Right? Well, there's a little pretext here. You're, yeah. you're not only a researcher, you're also a person who stutters. Right. You, so just do the pretext. Can you just give the got it, got it. Okay, right. Person who stutters, right? My older brother stutters, my you know, my maternal uncle, I've got maternal cousins. It's all on my Italian side. There we go, right? So little kid, man, I began a speech therapy at age uh, five, right? Taken out of school, right? Things like that. And then my mom and dad, being the progressives they are, said, you know what? You need to see a good stuttering therapist, right? So we went to a specialist, uh, Dr. Bill Schrum, who was at the university at Chico State uh, for years, right? And so I, I got speech therapy through my childhood into college, right? So for me, it was always a different therapist because I'd have a different graduate student every year, you know, growing up there. It was wonderful, but I learned um, as a person, right? I grew up with therapy. I 
here I'm this person, right? Even in first grade, taking out of class, missing playing basketball, going to activities, I'm in speech therapy, right? My whole, that was it. Part of my initial thought was I'm going to resist this man. I want to go play basketball. I want to be on the baseball team. I'm going to hide it. You know, I'm just going to go around. So even in kindergarten, it was like the teacher said, Hey, um, tomorrow, everybody talk about your family. Tell us how many brothers and sisters you have. Like, I'm going, God, I can't say the word brother, man. What am I going to do? Right. I'm in five years old kindergarten. in kindergarten, kindergarten, right? So I'm in kindergarten. I'm five, right? And I'm going, God, I got to say brother tomorrow, man. What am I going to do? So my dad had like this big book under our telephone, our rotary dial telephone, right? And I look it up, it was called a thesaurus, right? A thesaurus, right? I'm five, what kindergartner picks up a thesaurus, right? So I pick it up, I go, man, I got to get another word for brother. I got to get another word for brother. I look up, it says brother, a male sibling. I'm like, yes, I'm good because B words are tough. I get in front of the class. And they say, okay, Gerald, I'm Gerald, I told Tom Cruise movie, I became Jerry, but Gerald, hey, Gerald, uh, tell us about your family. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I said, I have four siblings, three males and one female. Great. I didn't say a B word. I'm like, yes, I got ready. And I sat back down. So that's it. Therapy all along, person who stutters, right? When I get into college and med school, I said, you know, well, even before in high school, I said, you know what? There's something with me. This therapy is helping, but there's something not quite there entirely. I think there's something in my brain, man. I, I don't know, because I, I look to another kid in class. I'm like, I'm not smarter than this guy. And he can just talk. Like, what is it? I have therapy. What's, I'm doing these things. So that's why I became a doctor. I became a doctor to say, I want to really figure this out. So through med school and I started doing research, my first publications, I was still in school. I joined the National Stuttering Association really three years after it started in the NSP. I was a student. I was a chapter. I started going to my chapter. You know, I was I'm a person who stutters. So I'm kind of growing up and the people say, oh, you will become a doctor. You're a doctor. Okay, I'm going to find out someone's stuttering. Oh, that's great, kid. Go ahead. But I grew up and then I started doing research. And I said, you know, I think medicines could do something here. And that's where I've grown. So I've uh, Working with my doctors, taking medicines. I'm my first guinea pig with everything, right? So I don't you're, prescribe You're not myself. only the leading researcher, you're also um, one of the subjects. Well, in my research, I can't be. Because not a FDA subject regular. in the research, yes. but you are, right. you're in rolling, words, you're experiencing I, it both on the inside, but also in the laboratory, but it's part of your life and you've been working it's with It's my life med. and it's, it's, it's my mission. I really think there's a, no, why am I here? Why is it a little boy, right? What can I do? You know, um, and that's why. So well, I think I'm so it's like, I'm glad that yeah. you had a thesaurus, man. That's <laughs> good. I had a thesaurus. What would have happened if you didn't have a thesaurus and you uh, couldn't think about that? I would have been uh, avoiding more. It would have hit my mind more. I, I wasn't even in therapy yet because it was kindergarten, right? I didn't think, I don't think I started therapy until maybe second grade, third grade. You were already like seven or eight. And adapt. You know, Chris Constantino, Chris Constantino, yeah. I love what he says. He says, look, you know, well, he doesn't say the first part. The first part is stuttering can be very hard. And, yeah. and Jerry knows that very, very well, aside from the very positive spirit and everything he's doing now. He knows all too well the very, very, very dark and challenging parts of stuttering and what it can, what it can be like. And Chris Constantino likes to also look at what are some stuttering games? What are some right. of the things that Growing up with stuttering, what are some things that it's taught you, that it's given you, that have become muscles that are stronger for you because of the fact that you grow up with a stutter? Now, I think that's profound. One of yeah. the games that a lot of people say is they say they're like a walking thesaurus. So right. learning that you think you can't say a certain word, you start having much more thinking about various ways to say the same thing, which can be frustrating and exhausting, but ultimately can be a great you know, lexicon builder, but so go hey, back. Can to I, yeah, yeah, but I just want to say too, right. Okay. So yeah. So I, I've worked on a new compound. I think uh, we're actually on a phase three of, of a new compound. And I can say this eco pam, right. I'm not on that study because it's FDA regulated and uh, we, we worked on it. We thought of it just like COVID vaccines, right. Like Oxford Mind University might develop something, but then a pharmaceutical company has to pay for it and bring it through the process. So that's where we are. You see Riverside thinks of this, my university with me. And now there's a company with these trials. So that's just the FDA process. So there's a study going on now with EcoPipam. We've published as well, too, that there's not the weight gain. 
there could be other side effects like feeling depressed and other things. So we have to do the phase three trial. I can't say it's a cure yet. It's double blind placebo control, just like COVID vaccines. That study is going to start like this next week. You can go under, under a website, clinicaltrials.gov, ECOPIPAM, that. But, you know, we've got that. Um, so I'm on a similar compound. I can't divulge it yet because of all this non-disclosure. It's already an FDA approved compound, but it's not approved for stuttering. My doctor um, that I work with, I, I went to him and said, maybe I think this might work for stuttering and it won't have the weight gain. So what you've seen is this drastic weight loss um, since May uh, of wow. 40, uh, 42 pounds. I'm back actually to my uh, weight. I was in college, actually right after high school. I'm pretty sure with my wife, I might wear my letterman's jacket that I had in 10th grade. We're going to see. No, we... so you're right though. She can even tell. It's great. Can I just share a gain that I've had? Please, right? please. It's not only for me as a person who started to say, like, committed, I got to understand what's wrong, but I really want to help. But it also taught me, hey, therapy's good, right? It's important, right? Self-help in my journey. Before I was on medicine, I was in the NSP, then the NSA, right? That's helped me as much as anything. My therapy, my self-help, my ed acceptance, that's mm -hmm. all a journey. And then the medicines are all part of that. So that's the model that I really am working with. Uh, I was just on a call a little late with a great speech language pathologist. Yeah, she and I, she and I yeah. hung out just like you and me over yeah. fish and wine. Although I didn't. Alita's great, her. right? If we were in and, Croatia a year ago. It's hard to believe we could do yeah, that. Yeah, so she was there, right? And we're just talking about a mutual thing here. Sorry, I ran over time with yeah, her, sure. but it's all about acceptance and self-help, understanding, education, empowerment. And for many of us too, maybe a medicine to kind of boost things along. That's just kind of a theory. It's not mutually exclusive. And that's what we're doing. And we're riding up with her, we're here. I really think this is the future of stuttering treatment. You and I have been talking for years about this, your dad, all of us, it's like, this is where we go. Because in depression, when I treat people with depression, it's not like here's Prozac, see you later. We're working in right. therapy. We're right. looking in acceptance, self-help. It's not one or the other. So that's so just a game. to be clear, yeah. for a lot of yeah. people, they hear yeah. your name, they hear about the research we're doing, and they think, okay, how soon before it's approved so that I have the pill? I could just right. take the pill, blue pill or the red pill? Which pill do I take? Stutter or right. no stutter? So it's not that simple. You want to just unpack that really? Oh, I'll explain that too. Okay, right. Yeah. right. We already have medicines on the market that can help stutter. Not everybody. We're learning that there's different, all of you say this word, we never used to say this, causes of stutter. There are different, I really believe the data I have, I'm working with our great colleague in Sweden, Per Alm, ALM, great researcher. Per just published a great article. Look at it in Frontiers in Neuroscience. If you haven't seen this journal, it's a special issue journal being edited by our colleague, Pierpolo Busan, who's an Italian stuttering researcher, Martin Sommer in Germany, I've got one article in there, hopefully two more. Pear's got one in there. It's the latest science on stuttering. It's a special issue. Just look it up. Suan Chang's in there, Scott Yaris is in there. We're all doing this stuff. We're understanding of the brain and everything is bringing it together. But Pear and I, right, Pear's work, uh, work that postulated, he just published that what we thought long ago that there's a minority of people who stutter because it's an infectious cause. When we're little kids, this is crazy, but it's true. We've seen in OCD and Tourette's that you have an infection as a little kid, uh, usually a little boy, could be a little girl, and you get an autoimmune cross reaction that attacks the developing part of our brain like a PANS, a sort of pediatric autoimmune neurologic syndrome, attacks your brain and that's why we stutter. So it's a sudden onset, there's some of us, right? Then there's people like me, who's a genetic form of stuttering. And we know it's going to be different kinds of genes. Drainage genes says this. My friends in China, our work says this. They're all going to be- Billy famous. Joe's going to be on soon. We'll talk about genes with Shelly yeah, Joe. Crabbe. Right. And what we're going to do, right? I'm working with, I'll work with Shelly Joe and others in pair and uh, Sharir Sheikh Baha'i, great guy, NIH researcher, young guy, also stutters, right? Um it's a unified theory. We're going to show why all these genes and all this is why it's there. We're going to come out with all that. So, but with that, I'm committed here. So I, I tried this. I wouldn't give these medicines are on the market, some of them, but they're not marketed for stuttering. There's no pharmaceutical company that's going to market it and get a label, except right now that's in phase three. We've convinced, uh, we'll that's say phase two. Now. 
you got it right. I've got another one I'm wor wor working on from a great company called. Was Teva. that a stutter there, Jerry? I just want to. It was. You got people, it, man. For yeah. people that see how quick the the Jerry Maguire brain goes and yeah. how much he's producing, both verbally and in literature in research, uh, he still occasionally does stutter. Right, but if I stop these medicines, right, my it's right. This back. What I would the stutter look days. like if you, if you didn't take the meds that you're taking? Right. What would what would Jerry's speech look like? Because I think interesting. It's a very interesting and provocative question. Adults yeah. who seem to get over it seem to be cured, and then you talk to them and you find out they still have moments. They have blocks, but it's so. What is it for you? Like if you didn't take the meds? Okay. Or, if I don't take the medicines for three days, three days for me, four days, I'm back to moderate on the SSI. I've got eye blinks, facial contortions, uh, hesitations, blocks. I'm right back. So for me, it's not I've recovered. I'm treated, right? I'm treated. That's it. Like we treat diabetes. If someone stops their medicines, their blood sugar goes up. Yeah, I'm treated. I, mean, I have hypertension. I've had high blood pressure since age 22. My mom, my, my and you're not cured. It. My, you're not cured. I'm yet. not cured. I got to tell you, but if I stop my lisinopril, in two days, my blood pressure is back up. So I'm treated. I'm treated. Right. Big difference. So if you want to, next time I'm on, I'll stop my medicines for four or five days. And I'll, I'll come I was going to ask you that. Would, would yeah, right. you do, have you ever done that? Have you ever taken a week and, and said, you know what? Oh, yeah. I don't really mean to. But let's say I go on a trip somewhere like, ah, I forgot to pack it. Damn, it's going to be a tough trip. It, I, it's, I don't intentionally. Uh, maybe I have to take a week off. I'll do that for you, but not during the baseball playoffs. I want to cheer for my San Diego Padres. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Um, but I want to tell you another game, another game, not just about a thesaurus, right? Yeah. But as a clinician, as a father, as a husband, right? Stuttering develops compassion, humility, far greater than a thesaurus, right? I've worked with thousands of people with stuff, right? My, I'll say this, my staff, my medical assistants, right? I have patients with depression, bipolar, majority are, are people who stutter. My staff who schedule my patients love the people who stutter, right? We people who stutter are so understanding as a group, right? We are not complainers, right? It's been hard for us as kids, the bullying and so forth. So when someone treats us like that, we're so happy back, right? So I just tell you, people, I hire nurses and stuff. They never work with people. So they just come up to me like, hey, man, these people, they're great patients. They're so, they show up on time. They're so appreciative. They're what, they, other people, right? Can be rude, right? Demanding. I can't think of one person who stutters, right? Who I, my staff has ever said, you know what? This guy's a real pain in the ass, McGuire. Do we really need to see? It's the opposite. My, my staff says, these are great people. And also, right, I've trained doctors and students who stutter, right? There, I got to tell you, there are bad doctors. Right? There are doctors who, you know, who yell at people, throw stuff in the operating room. Nurses hate them, right? They're big. They might be good doctors and skills and techniques, but people don't like them. They don't connect. Every doctor I've trained who stutters, people love. And I got to tell you why, kind of as a virtue, right? It's not how we speak that patients want to know. Patients say he listens to me, right? And we people who stutter are damn good listeners, you know? And so I have never, and I had... Before I became a psychotherapist, I wasn't treated. I, I mean, it's fake. I was treated with therapy, but I wasn't as fluent, I just say, fluent as I know. Let's tell you this story, right? My first ever psychotherapy patient, right? A talk therapy. I had people in medical school where say, you can't be a psychiatrist. You don't talk. You've got to be a pathologist. Tell us about that. Your med school right. experience where you got put Yeah, in it was great. Because you're talking about your students who stutter who are in med school and you said they become great doctors and obviously have an affinity for them, but you're feeling like they're good doctors. You didn't have that experience, did you? No, I got to tell you, even at most medical schools, 
they don't get that still. I get people call me still what in the your, United what States. What was your story? Let's go personal. Go okay, we'll go personal, right? I'm in college, right? I interview for med school. It's an oral interview. You go to these schools, right? And I know within 10 minutes of interviewing the guy, and I'm stuttering very because not only was I, you know, I'm nervous, right? I'm I'm a 21 year old kid going to this high powered place, meeting with some big professor. So for, I didn't even own a suit. Right? I had to go get a suit. Right? I'm a kid from Paradise. Like first time I bought it, I'm wearing up, a tie. Didn't you up in a shirt like this, a print? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. So I'm wearing a suit for the first time. First time wearing a tie. Go into this guy. You're you're very nervous. I'm stuttering way a lot. I'm like, and I know in the first five minutes, I'm not getting in here. This guy's not going to take me. Finally, one you know, a couple of schools believed in me, right? And I was able to go, and they saw that, right? I'll also tell you then, right, I'm glad I got the MD. They agreed with me. Now, even to become a licensed physician in the United States, you got to take a 30-minute timed exam. Oral. You got to oral. You got to interview someone with no notes, ask them all these questions, and then present it to somebody for 30 minutes in a timed manner. They don't accommodate. Boy, was I nervous, man. I got there. I passed, right? Then I go to residency interviews, right? And I go to people, I'm stuttering. I wasn't, there was no meds that we understood. I went to some high powered places. I, was, I went to UCLA and Duke and Northwestern, all this stuff. And I said, I really want to study stuttering. And I stutter. I must like to look at this and look at brain imaging and genes and maybe medicines. No one's really doing this. And these guys at these high powered places says, you know what? No one's doing that. You, you can't do it, right? Then I go to a little place called UC Irvine, right? This beautiful weather and stuff. And the guy was interviewing me. He was a PhD MD, and he was wearing a Aloha shirt like this and flip flops like I am now, right? And I go there and I said, you know what? I, I stutter. I really want to do some research. I think I maybe I could help people. He's like, you know, it's a brilliant idea. No one's doing that. You should do it. You should come here. So I went there. He believed in me. But there was another doc there that I interviewed that day. And I could tell it wasn't going well, man. He was like, I had people telling me in med school, you can't, you have to be a radiologist. You can't talk to people. So I'm interviewing with this guy and I could just tell it's not going well. Like he, you know, when you're a person who stutters, like, hey, this guy to me, yeah, you know, whatever. So anyway, it goes on for that. You know, he's like my faculty for the next four years. I reluctantly, I guess I'm in this program because the other guy believed in me. And he's kind of treating me poorly. All this kind of stuff. So anyway, like four years later, right, my classmates, like me, the other faculty. So I became what's called the chief resident, right? I was in charge of all that, even though I'm a person who studies, right? Yeah. So one day, right, the coordinator had all these paper files out of all the evaluations because he was transferring them to microfiche, right? Like today we'd scan them, right? So they're there. I'm just walking by the desk and there it is, my evaluation from my interview from that guy. I'm like, who? I can't help but not look at that. I'm not supposed to look at my own file, but I look at it. All these assessments talk about knowledge base, compassion, one to five scale, five being good. He circles all ones that I'm not compassionate. I have poor knowledge. And all he writes in comments stutters. That's it. That's it. So in other words, I got to be, I have no compassion. I have no knowledge just because I stutter. You know, I'm Jerry, wait a second. You're yeah. telling the story 2020. It is 2020. You tell it in hindsight. At that right. time, can you share like what that did to you as a student who felt you just bombed it? You had these high hopes. You're in this position. You looked at something you shouldn't have looked at, and it yeah. validated your greatest fears of what your intuition it told you. my greatest fears. Well, that also tells me that even physicians, even psychiatrists, have a stigma against yeah. people. It's under you know, it's like, wait a minute, this is supposed to be the healing profession. Understand yeah. it. But you know what's later? I became that guy's boss, and let me see, he's not around anymore. <laughs> But what was it like yeah. for you as a young man? That's what I want to get well, to. Well, to me, first. I got to tell you, man, I felt the injustice, right? And I said, I'm not going to sit back. I'm going to change this, right? Mm. So literally what happened in three years, I became that guy's boss. Couldn't get rid of him. But the minute he screwed up, honestly, had a sexual harassment thing against him, I'm not defending him. He's got to go. And I'm like, yeah, this guy's a jerk anyway. See you later. I won't say his name, but that's it. That's you know, the word's karma. Powerful. Yeah. I just want to highlight, and this is outside the scope, but this is the real deal, is that nobody who stutters and no professional should be boxed into one camp. People think Jerry right. Maguire, they think this is the guy with the meds. 
No, this is the guy with the Aloha shirt drinking mint, lemon water. <laughs> Well, it's all like I got okay infusion water. I grow lemons in my backyard and mint. So, man, this is how you avoid diet sodas. I'm whatever telling you, this is how you lose 42 pounds. Soda, whatever you're drinking, I'll have some. Lachaim, cheers, yes. awesome. Yeah, but yeah. it's amazing because because it speaks to another person would be in that same situation, Jerry, and they would feel buried, and they would yes. feel like a nail in the coffin. That's it, my yeah. career, and they would go back into retreating into their turtle shell, which is yeah. a legitimate response. And you had this feisty, maybe the Italian piece, you know, <laughs> you I'm going to show them we're going to, we're going to fight for justice. And I think it's so powerful because so many people have come on this conversation. Yeah. And one of the themes I'm picking up is somebody opened a door for me. Someone yeah. believed in me, someone right. along the way, gave me the belief, gave me the hope, created an opportunity, stood right. out, was a champion for me when other people weren't. And that's a big game changer. And then those people end up paying it forward. And that seems to they, be- they, That's it. I do that there. For me, it was my interview with St. Louis University Medical School. That went well. Dr. Moots was there. He's still there. Um, this was 30 years ago. Dr. George Grossberg was there. He, so go to psychiatry, be a great psychiatrist. Even today, he's in practice, right? I've always called him Dr. Grossberg, right? He's the guy, right? But you know what? Two years ago, they invited me back to my med school to give a special grand rounds to all the doctors on stuttering. I was like this alum, right? They believed in me 30 years ago when I was, and you know what? I'm like, damn, you guys believed in me anything you need. Let's say what schools I give to as an alum, that's that school. You know why? Because they believed in a kid right. who was 21 years old stuttering. And they said, this kid could be a good doctor when any everybody of, else, teachers, parents, aunts, uncles, right. position of influence. Well, yeah. my dad and mom always agreed. My uncle, right. They all stuttered. So my family was open. Like he stutters, but it doesn't mean anything right to me. We'll just get him some therapy, help him. Never. I could do that. It was never a question. So I had great support from my family. Wonderful. Right. And then at the university, I found a university. I found professors who mm -hmm. believed in me, you know, and they really said, yeah, you can be a good doctor. You should be a psychiatrist. It's great. I will tell you this in one other session, right? My first talk therapy patient. And it's not just about a teacher. It's even what a Jerry, you do talk like. therapy? I do, man. I'm a psychotherapist. Well, you talk. It sounds like you do very good talk therapy. Yeah, keep going. Okay. Yeah, okay. So a psychiatrist, right? We do talk therapy and meds. I do all this stuff, right? I do psychoanalytic, cognitive behavioral, right? So wow. as, as a second year resident, I just have a psychotherapy patient, right? Your first one. So in other words, I finished med school. Now I'm training for four years in medicines and psychotherapy. This idea that psychiatrists have to give meds is not a good psychiatrist. We do everything, right? right. So if you're with so a prescriber, I'm, by the way, on this point, just the side yeah. the parentheses, your comment on for anyone interested or, or, or their psychiatrist is interested in dabbling in exploring some of the meds we've discussed or that you're researching and we'll have more evidence right. for, uh, can you just give some do's and don'ts just as a real quick okay, got, it. got it. People from all over the world could be watching this, right? As we know, right? There are some countries I, you can go to. Could. I know they are. Like, got it. Okay. From Europe was on in a minute. We got people all over. Yeah, got all over, right? I know there are some countries, right, where someone can go into a pharmacy and pick up something without a doctor's order or guidance. That's different Don't. than the dispensary. That's different than the dispensary in Colorado. We're talking about right. like it's legitimate. Different medications are right. just on order right. in certain countries. Do not take any of these without guidance of a good physician who knows the potential side effects and dosages, right? People all over the world, they email me like, I took this medicine, I bought it at a pharmacy in whatever country, and they took right. the wrong my friend, dose. My friend had a prescription. Right. I don't, don't ever do that because- it could, if you've got another medical condition, it's not good. Right. Or you take a super high dose that right. can cause a side effect or a dose that wouldn't even work and you say it didn't work. Right. So, and it's got to be under a physician's guidance, right? And monitoring for side effects. And that physician must know. Unfortunately, 99% of doctors around the world have no idea of stuttering. That's so true. if you go in there and you say, I want a pill for stuttering, they give them something that won't work. Not every, not, most pills don't work. And then that people say, I've tried medicines, they don't work. But if they're medicine, it would be like, hey, I tried, a, you know, I tried a, 
you know, uh, insulin for my high blood pressure. It didn't work. Like, it doesn't work for that. So a good doctor, and if that doctor doesn't know what's doing, reach out to me. That's, That's right. it. Good. It's important. Good. You got it. Also talk therapy. My first ever talk therapy patient, right? And it was a patient who was seeing like some high end Newport Beach psychiatrist, right? She was probably paying back then, you know, 400 bucks an hour, right? Beautiful, right? And then she gets a divorce, right? And she didn't have the money. So she's got to go see the trainee at the university for like 20 bucks an hour, right? So I'm seeing there, she's my first patient. I'm like, and I'm stuttering, man. I'm so nervous, right? I'm interviewing, I have to ask questions, right? I'm thinking in my mind, God, she was seeing this high-end psychiatrist cash pay. And I think, you know, she's lost her money. I just think in her mind, like, this is what I get for 20 bucks. Like guy who's right out of med school who stutters. I'm like, oh my God, I'm done. Her therapist got this whole talk conversation talking. It's going in my head. I'm like going, oh man, I don't think I can do this. I can't be a talk therapist. Why I go into this field. And at the end of the hour, she says, you know, she had depression and anxiety and issues with her ex-husband. And she said, you know what, Dr. McGuire? I, I'm really going to, I'm going to like working with you because I can see you've struggled with something your whole life. So you'll really understand me. I'll see you next week. And I'm like, I should have given her 20 bucks. She made me feel so good. 20 bucks. Don't be cheap. No, no. But that's what it was as a resident. Yeah. So it yeah. taught me something. It yeah. taught me something that we people who stutter have so much to offer. It's not if I was fluent or not. I got the information. It took me a little longer. But what that showed my patient is I'm not perfect. I'm a human being. And to her, I understand her. I am not this doctor mandating. She was even complaining how the other doctor never connected, even though he was 400 bucks an hour and I was 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a person who's felt it. I was in therapy, right? It might take me longer to ask my question or comment. But she was my patient for I have never, ever had a patient say, I'm not going to see you because you're stutter or even tell my nurse or anything. No one's fired me. And my, I've never had a malpractice lawsuit even so filed take, against me. Two takeaways. Yeah. One is if you're a person who stutters and you have the interest in pursuing right. either talk, talk therapy as a profession or medicine, you should know that Jerry is yeah. living proof that in his journey, aside from that one doctor who was a real schmendrick, and there will be those haters and people out there that are going to give you a hard time. He has not had a patient say, I don't want to be treated by this person. He hasn't had someone come back, not come back because of his stutter. So all the thoughts that you hold yourself back, yes, you, you got it. Jerry and others as a counter story of evidence of, of kind of testing reality that the world is ready. And in fact, may even have an affinity to the authenticity and the connection and some of those gains that Jerry right. talked about, listening, the empathy, the connection. And what the woman said is so powerful because I think for yeah. those of us that don't stutter, in, myself included, or my father, when we're working with people, it's a strange thing that happens. People ask, you stutter, right? No, no. Well, how do you get it? How do you get yeah. it? So through listening and these conversations yeah. and enlightening right. people, but also, if you're a person that's gone through something else, she didn't need help with stuttering, but she appreciated that you were someone that went through something. You and got I, it. And I'll also tell you that too, yeah. right? I treat depression, right? I connect with my patients. Fortunately, I've never had depression. I've never been suicidal. I'm so thankful. My, many of my patients have, but I get it. And as I haven't lit stuttering, I really get, but I can feel their pain well. My patients say I connect with them. It's just reflective statements where I say, my patient says, you know, struggling with suicide and depression. I could say, for instance, right now, I'm treating a patient who's suicidal, but just coming through, she had, was severely abused as a child, sexually, physically, it's an awful, right? And so fortunately, I had a good childhood. I didn't, you know, I had great, you know, but with me, I, I, I'm not, the words I say is I can only imagine how hard that was for you as a little girl to endure that. I can only imagine. I, it's just so, but then I say reflective statements. You've been a great mom. You stopped this. You married a good man who doesn't do this. You're healthy. You're free. Congratulations. 
what you've overcome is, I can't even imagine what you've overcome, but I'm so proud of you. We're going to work on, we have to, your, your resilience is amazing. So even fortunately, I never had anything like that to me, right? As severe as what sexual trauma or abuse, fortunately, right? Um, but she sees me every week and we've done this for 15 years, my talk therapy and it's the connection. She, I'm the only person she's told this to. Wow. Right? And now it's coming out to her husband, maybe a friend. You know, I'm a, a male, right? I'm That's 10 right. years younger than she is, right? But just forming that alliance, that openness, the key as well as a, is non-judgmental, right? A good therapist doesn't judge. We just allow this to happen. And if she says these things about her mixed feelings toward these people in her childhood, I understand. I don't judge. I just say, I can imagine that. And your feelings are natural. And, you know, it's reflective statements. So there you've got, I really want to think. Yeah, yeah. Plug for the NSA, the National Studying Association. Right. One of the great things they're doing right now is an initiative on these things with stigma. Right. Especially right. in employment. So the WeWork project. I encourage everybody to check it out. I had a wonderful chat with Pamela Mertz and with Carl Coffey and Kathy's right. company. And I, I got to tell you, another thing we're going to do here, I've started on my chair, a community relations committee. Mm. What I want to do, right, I'm going to put this bold, our next year, my goal as chair, we're going to mobilize, is through education with leaders, is to make stuttering a parity diagnosis and treatment. What I mean by that is insurance companies in America and Medicare restrict access for people with stuttering. It is a stigma, it is a discrimination. Mental health went through something similar where for years, the insurance companies and Medicare and Medicaid would say, you know what? We're not covering psychotherapy for depression. We're not covering psychiatrist visits, right? It's not a medical condition, right? You have to pay out of pocket. So that's why people with depression never got care. Even now with stuttering, correct or I'm wrong, Uri, most insurance companies don't pay. They don't it's pay. Tricky, tricky and you have to, Katie Gore and the NSA have done a lot and I borrowed from it, but they have the good you're right. so you can fight with the insurance company to get what you're entitled to, but it's still a fight. It's an uphill battle. Got to tell you, it's a fight. So what actually, it was a fight for us in medicine, psychiatry yeah. for years. Yeah. All it's got to take is a ruling. I won't tell you how this could happen, right? To really list stuttering as a parity, P-A-R-I-T-Y, diagnosis. That means it's the same as depression or whatever, however you label it. I'm not, you know, not, and you to got throw, it, not to throw it into a, a, a bucket of things that are different than it, but to give it the entitlement of benefits and reimbursement. Exactly. I got to tell you that this is the deal behind why I've always said it has to be listed as a disorder, right? There's a lot of talk about why we shouldn't do that. I got to tell you, if you'd say it's nothing, there'll never be treatment. There'll never be research, right? It's so important. I just want to highlight that, that you and I have talked about this. I remember uh, in Fort Lauderdale right. sitting on the table, you know, this binary yeah. conversation about no, you know, uh, neurodiversity, we need to accept, we need to go with a social model and reject the medical model of disability and disorder. It, there's something to that. People who right. stutter should be accepted for who they are right. and as, as fully capable and fully valued people, no different than anyone else as with so many things. And there's a big stigma we need to fight against. But this business that Jerry's talking about is, is the same thing I talk about when I label kids with a diagnosis, which I never do. I don't label kids but for the sake of a report, for the sake yeah. of an IP, for the sake of funding for care and access to certain rights and privileges, one needs to use the lingo and the- And I gotta tell you there, or even bigger, I have said, acceptance neurodiversity and research and treatment are one that's they're the right. first they're step exclusive. they're Everybody not mutually exclusive, exclusive right so for instance how does again, it go together it goes together right with depression right acceptance is the first thing right 
You accept it, you work with self-help, you work on your therapy. The world now can't discriminate against someone who's depressed. That's the advocacy, that's neurodiversity. But at the same time, they we champion for better research and better treatments. That's why I thought back from people in my own organization, hey, they're all one, they're all one. Acceptance, diversity, understanding, advocacy, support, they're all together treatment and research and the understanding. If we ignore what it is, I'm going to share with you. There's a Frontiers in Neuroscience Journal right now, special tell this, issue. Tell me this, but I also have two pages of written notes that I have questions about okay. big thing, dopamine, but you tell me about that. Okay, I got it. So I'm going to do this, right? So there's a new issue out, Frontiers in Neuroscience, right? Look at the journal, special issue editor by Pierpolo Busan, our great colleague in uh, Trieste, Italy. Just new data from Per Alm. Uh, Scott Yaris is in there, Su Wen Chang. We've written articles. I'm in there, Nicole Neath. It is clear. It is clear. We have different causes of stuttering. I'm going to say this word, different causes. Mm -hmm. We're understanding genetic, autoimmune, bunch of things we got, right? It's clear, right? We can't ignore the evidence, right? It is clear as well that we can biologically treat stuttering. It's clear. There's effective treatments. They're not cures right? There are differences in brain phys physiology, differences in medical causes of stuttering. I can use the word cause now. It's bold. We have effective treatments. And what we're proposing is these treatments as the first stage is acceptance and understanding and therapy and maybe biologic treatments. They're going to be there, folks. It's coming. In one to two years, there'll be medicines marketed for stuttering. So the people words ask, is people ask me what in the world I have to do with you in University of California, Riverside yeah. School of Medicine. So that's something Jerry uh, spoke to me about the the part that I can play in the clinical side is kind of yes. looking at the, the presentation of these subtypes, right? And figuring you got out, it exactly because what we don't we, we understand out who's yeah. different, who are these subgroups. So we got one umbrella, and it's important to have one big tent called right. stuttering because it helps people yeah. find community, helps people find support, helps people find people who get it helps them find their people, people that are going through similar experiences. But the treatment for two people is gonna be as different as night and day potentially because they might have different causes. They might have different temperament. They might have different uh, comorbid uh, issues that they're dealing with, whether one has depression and the other has ADD and the other has neither. Bingo. So treatment needs to look different and needs to be yeah. multi considering different factors. And so what I'm looking right. to contribute in this team here, which is like, humbling to be in the presence on these Zoom calls. I said that to Scott. Right. I, I always highlight who's on the Zoom call and I say, wow, how yeah. did I end up here? But um, the subtypes are very, very important. And clinically, that's yes. what we've known. That's what we've seen. And what the team is doing, looking at it from the point of view of, of genes, looking at uh, scans, looking at the response to different meds, you start right. to see it very clear. There are Me different too. types of people who stutter. You got it. And there's likely means different causes. For instance, hypertension, right? High blood pressure. I've got high blood pressure since 22, right? Many people diet and exercise. That's it, right? Uh, other people, no matter what you do, medicines are needed, right? right? Other people, it's decreasing stress in their life, anxiety, everything else, right? So it's all together. And it, what we're going to do- the, yeah. Even in the studies that you showed, um, I think it's important to highlight. It's not poking a hole in them, but when you look at the sample size and you look yeah. at the response to the therapy, while you get a good result of effect, the variability between the subjects is quite interesting, right? It is, so right? So I got to say, right, any medicine I develop, right, at best will work in 60% of people, right? When we look at that, right, best. It's just a genetic variability that we have. So it's that doesn't work, right? This, we're really beginning to end this next phase of the EcoPyTam studies will really show that if, you know, um, what it is, right? There are different aspects of stuttering, right? Where ecopipan and where, you know, olanzapine, right? Work on fluency, I'll use that term, percent of stutter, duration of blocks, right? But then they start to address the other issues, the social anxiety, the avoidance, right? Then we develop a compound. Those work on dopamine. Dopamine is the agent that really helps timing initiation of speech, right? So can you give, and yeah. you, did this, you did this so beautifully for me. Can you just give a quick share on these two loops of speech in Got the it. brain, in the neuroscience? Now, 
and yeah, you could pull up anything. I'll give you. I'm going to show that right here. Got it here. Really. I just wanted to there. say if you could if you could share with people how certain types of even speech therapy seem to right. address one of those loops. What the meds are. I got at, it. You've got it. Right. One and B two. Go for it. Got it. Go. Well, give me a. You know what? You were good on time because I just. Uh, yeah, we got a few minutes. That's fine. No, don't worry. I just told my next meeting I'm late, which is good. All right. So let me go here under Thank share. You. Thank you for that. There are people. I'm good. Hey, you know what? This is the most important thing, man. We're well, going here, right? It's not all a lot stuttering. Of Thanks for making the time. Okay. Good. Sorry I was late. All right. This is a study I did. I was still a trainee. I was just in med school. I was a resident, right? We looked. I was the first person to really do what's called pet imaging scans and stuttering. This is years ago, right? People said he's a med guy, right? That's where I've evolved to. But I've also done imaging work. I've done, we're the first university to have a brain donor program. We're actually looking at tissues and brains. No one's ever done that, no other university. All right, so what we have here are brain scans. These are people who stutter um, in there, right? It's a composite image. We're doing an activity, we're reading aloud alone. So we're stuttering, right? Here we are stuttering, right? Higher this vision is of the brain. Activity, not structure. Activity, so right. Different structures are different. Now we got better structures. Su and Chang, everybody. But higher level means it's using more glucose, more fuel. So if I'm moving my right arm, that area that controls the right arm is going to light up, right? So we're speaking. Here we go. These are higher dose area of the brain. Look in here. These are people who uh, don't stutter. These are controls, right? So we people who stutter, right? We're lower. They're more red here. The people who stutter or controls have higher activity in the speech areas, right? Broca's area here, right? Um, and here as well to right here big difference here all these people are right-handed so pop it out see how blue this is right here look at how yellow this is here it's more active this is an area of the brain just on the left side this is known as a, a statistical subtraction image right we're taking these composite images of all people who stutter and it pops out right there an area of the brain called the caudate and cutamen known as the striatum this is not active in people who stutter and Sue Wan Chang's work and Nicole Neves and Watkins and everybody has shown this is true, right? We've actually looked at the salamocortical loop. Sue Wan's done this work where this region of the brain, right, through this whole system doesn't develop right in our brains who stutter. It's now, definitive. For the, for the people, what's the responsibility or role of the striatum? Got it. I will show that, right? We're going to show that. I'll give you another slide here, right? So I will so say this. We're seeing, seeing the, the difference in function in that area of the striatum. What's important to understand is what does the striatum do? Got it. The striatum really works as our switch, the timer and initiation of movement. And speech is the most fine muscle movement we have. Right? Most complex, so, the most fine. Most, most complex, complex, right. And that's where I even say, right, as much as we'd like to have an animal model, a mouse squeak, for instance, right? I heard you in have our, some Mike who stutter in that, in that recent article there. Yeah, well, it's not my, well, I'm getting access to it. I'm going to tell you, but I also said, right, I think it's a stretch to go from squeaks to higher human cortical voice. Well, so, absolutely. The other thing that's missing in mice is they don't have language. They don't have novel language. Bingo, right? So anyway, well, looking at that, there might be something, right? Carry Even, on. Carry on, right? Even when we looked at finches, right, with Dr. Roosevelt, right? Songbirds, it's different. We are human. That's what right. makes us different is really reasoning and speech. Our brains were much more frontal lobe than the chimpanzee, we'll say, right? We verbally communicate. It's one of the higher, it's what makes us human. We'll go there. That's why I like to say stuttering in many respects is the most highest, most complex human condition, right? Because we're working at something unique in speech, right? I would like to say too quickly, my cardiology friends have a lot easier because if they study a, you know, a dog's heart, or they pig's heart. ours, or right. pig's heart, right? We're talking about really the most complex human brain and language. Okay, here we go. So these are people who stutter, right? Again, right? Now we're making them fluent with chorus reading or singing, essentially, right? Where we're activating, why we're fluent. 98% of us, right? We can speak fluently and course reading or just reading it loud. That. I'm just going to reiterate it because Jerry's moving quick and he's got the pods, which are not Jabra's. So it's not as clear. I just yeah. want to make sure it's super yeah. clear. What we're looking at here is the contrast between reading aloud was the previous slide. This slide is looking at choral reading. So looking at the brain during choral reading. So here we know that people who stutter, most of them, when they're doing choral reading or singing or some kind of not, not that authentic communication or reading aloud, 
they tend to have more fluency. So here we've got a contrast to the previous slide. Yeah. Got it. Right. So now these are the people who stutter when, when they're stuttering. Now they're core reading and speaking fluently. Boom. We're more active, more red, right? You're, you're, everything pops up. Broca's area, right? It's all better, right? But look right there. What doesn't change is a striatum. God, we'll move on, right? So my colleague, my mentor, Dr. Glendon Riley, who's since passed away, great guy. We worked together. I was still a student. He's a professor of speech language pathology. I really learned speech language. Well, I'm not a speech language pathologist, but I understood from him. He's a great man, his wife, Gina. And he really proposed, we presented this in like Nijmegen in 95 and about two loops of speech. And this is also based upon Noodleman and others people's work. We have two loops of speech, an inner loop and an outer loop. You'll understand that, right? So here is our people who stutter, right? Wernicke's area, part of the brain. This is fine. We know what we want to say, right? We know what we want to say, right? Our normal speech, our natural speech, really is goes through the striatum. It's our timer initiator. We people who stutter have trouble with the beginning, usually initiating something and timing it. When we have to take another breath, we got to saw all over it. So we go through the striatum, Broca's area. This is it. It's Sue Un's work has looked at this. This is this thalamocortical loop, striatum, thalamus, Broca's area, where we think something's not right. And what it is is here, the striatum acts as that timer. It acts as that initiator. We see it with people with Parkinson's disease. It's like the conductor. It's like the conductor. It, it is, yeah. right? And it's sometimes if you give it a little push, right, it works better. So that's yeah. why we people who started to develop things where we say, well, uh, you know, uh, and get it going, right? So great, right? So here until recently, right? We really couldn't affect this area, right? So, but our great therapy, right? That works sometimes is activating this outer loop or other forms of therapy say, you know, get this strain started, ease into the word, slow down and time. It. So we're actually timing our straight under what we're reducing the demands, reducing the You're demands. That, right, so you've got it, right. To fall apart at a certain level. If we can reduce some of those demands, that seems to be going through that inner loop, right? You got it. You got it. And that's what therapy does. That's right. I'm telling you. Fluency yeah. shaping, fluency shaping, which goes on, let's say, rhythm or let's say like some metronome kind of therapy yeah. thing. That would be that that outer loop, perhaps. You got it. Or you explained it precisely, right? So well, this I is learned, the outer loop. I, I only understood it after you gave me some private uh, lectures on yes. it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, right. So that's the outer loop, right? It's other forms of therapy, right? So you got it, right? And that outer so loop, unique about that from a speech therapy clinical point of view, those are the things that often feel most unnatural. They feel right. most, most dissimilar you from authentic that. communication. And when you want to go authentic, you've got to go through that inner loop by definition. And you run into trouble because perhaps, perhaps that striatum, the conductor, does not coordinate in a way that makes things fluent. And so we're looking at different ways, both therapy, behavioral therapy, and things like that, as well as perhaps what are the pharmacological pieces where we can input to give it a little boost? What are those? Got it. You got it. This is wonderful. You and I are going to write an article on that. That was brilliant. We're on it. We're on it. You're on it. Got it. Okay. So here, our medicines, right, through dopamine, can increase the function of the strain. Yeah, there's not cures, right? You're just going to facilitate this conductor to work. Back, Once right? I just want to make sure I got that. It's a dopamine inhibitor, or a it where it's increasing dopamine. Yeah, no, I got to tell you here. I'm just going to say, I'm going to now evolve to the word modulation. Nice, right? I like that word. I like that regulation, modulation. We're going to modulate it, and that's where we're going to go because. In some people, right, increasing it may be the way to go. Most people blocking it because there's actually some people you've seen this if they're on a stimulant for Boom. ADHD. Because you got here. I want, you to, I want you to just highlight that. Many people ask, wait a second, my kid stutters and he also has raging in impulsivity that's really getting yeah. in the way of his life. And they want to give him meds. But I heard that if you give a kid who stutters a stimulant, you're going to put him through hell with his stuttering you you got it, it right so thing. got got it right five years ago i'd say yeah it's bad it's bad don't do it now there are medicine that 80 percent of the time it could make it worse right but we also have individuals they take a ritalin methylphenidate concerta adderall right they get better right and there are data years ago about methylphenidate helping some people who study and there's more data you know our good friend Joe uh, 
Joe uh, or Joe Donner. Donner, right. October twenty right. second, he'll be having a chat right. with me. Good, good guy. Well, just talking about that. I want to actually chat. We're going to highlight that. Right. You got that. I would love to. I love to. I love to talk to him about it, right? Because there's some, right? Joe and I got to talk to him. I'm talking to him for a while, but it's a modulation, right? And I'm working with Pear, Alm, and others, right? There are some people increasing the dopamine can help, others decreasing it, and some of our newer medicines modulate it. And it also depends on the receptor. So two or three years ago, I'd say block dopamine. You know what? Now, as we're understanding evolving, we're going to modulate it, but that's not the whole story. The Social anxiety that is so disabling for us who study. Really, that's also what good therapists do, right? We work on the social anxiety, the cognitive behavioral therapy, the avoidance, right? We're all there. Self help is great at that, right? We so stuttering, stu- just to, just for the again, if you can't follow, I'm just trying to break it down for those of us that process a little slower. <clears throat> There's stuttering, which is a physical neurophys. Would you support the idea of describing it as neurophysiological? Bingo. That's my article. What was the article I wrote? The neurophysiology of stuttering. So an neurophysiology of March. stuttering. And then right. you grow up with stuttering. You develop all kinds of psychosocial, emotional layers no. around that. And they certainly right. impact and interact and can exacerbate or can alleviate the experience because they do interact with each other. But at its core, it's not caused by trauma. It's not because you're an anxious person. But certainly if you have anxieties, diagnosed anxieties, or just a tendency towards being a worrier, that tendency is going to impact your experience and reactivity with stuttering, and this ties into this whole thing. But the loop you're talking about now is kind of like not even one of these loops. It's another layer that interacts with this, correct? Got it. You've also got great work by others, and Nicole and Nitty and others, about the cingulate and the amygdala being involved in this That's loop. Right. And that is where anxiety is kind of generated. The amygdala right? is not even on the scene. That's a little further right. out. It has an But it's there. Effect. I don't have it here. I don't have it here in this simplistic model, but it's right. an interplay there. And we'll That's share right. all that. So in other words, if you talk about, I even think maybe biologically, right? And, but definitely emotionally and psychologically, we people who stutter have been more prone to social anxiety. That's work out of Mark Onzel's labs and others, right? Very good. So you have to get all these data together, and it's not us versus them. It's all of us together, understanding and bringing the world. And that's, right. that I just want yeah. to highlight with all this the amazing generosity that Jerry has, bringing the people together, taking this time, going around the world, talking about this, but also the team at this Zoom call is like mind-boggling. You got Michigan, uh, Professor Chang, Shelley Joe Craft, Scott Yaris, Pear Am. I mean. Pulling people from so many different disciplines is the way we're going to get this forward. We've got to take like, you got a it. disciplinary team, and, and that's what's exciting about some of this stuff. So it's not just Jerry, this, this pharmacologist. It's really bringing together the people that have the knowledge and the expertise from different disciplines working together to get the fuller picture. You got it. So I was in Sydney emailing Mark Onzo last night, right? It's bringing all the different understandings into one. He's on deck. Our- he's on deck. He doesn't know it, but he's on deck, yeah. Great. Okay. Great talk. And and if you want to get Ross Ross Menzies. Oh yeah, this, Ross Menzies. I can't wait. Good, good guy. I'm just telling you guys, we bring in the you know everyone's got their understanding, their expertise. Just unite, get together. Shelly, Joe, Sue, One, Scott, Pear, Gonzalo, Liao, Annalise Bonen, every continent, right? Um, our colleagues in China, Japan, we're all working toward the same deal. Okay. So here, the like GABA in, yeah. can play a role. GABA can play a role through the singular, everything else. But here we're going to work at modulating dopamine and maybe even GABAergic agents. That's where Pagaclone. Actually, when we go back to Pagaclone, it didn't make it because of the following. When we submit this as a stupid thing about medication development in the USA, right? You actually have to submit to the FDA what's called your primary endpoint, right? And then if the FDA, if you hit that, the FDA says you can put it on the market, right? So the company at this time we're developing it, right? They decided, right, the FDA wants one primary input. You have to pick one, right? They picked at the time, as our best understanding in 2007, percent syllable study, right? Percent syllable study, right? Now, you know the variability in that, right? People had a good day, bad day. And we also show just by the fourth or fifth time, you see someone, we're stuttering less, right? right. We're less, okay. So what we showed there, right, it got better. People got better on Pagacorn, right? And Pagaclone, to also, clarify, in contrast to the Ecopipam, Pagaclone is working on the GABA. You got it. It's a GABA agent, right? So we showed some effect 
on fluency, right? Recent syllable stutter got some better, but because of the variability of stuttering, the placebo got better too. So when we looked meaning, at the meaning difference- Meaning as subjects went through this, whether they got the medication or they got the placebo, the, the, the way they were measuring impact with percentage syllable stutters all showed improvement because we know that that happens by itself, which is why on these newer studies, we've got multiple layers, which we worked Bingo. on, reviewed the transcript. Yeah. So the GABA, like, what, you're, yeah. what you're saying was, and we didn't get to go there because of the financial crisis, but the PAGA clone promise was very different than the ecopipam. Can you just draw out that? Yeah, I got that. So we were looking with PAGA clone with that percent syllable stutter, right? But because of the variability of the metric, we didn't need it, right? So the company in 2008, Teva and everybody said, you know, we don't have the stock price. The medicine is going to be off patent in 12 years. It's, and that's my dog All barking, good. sorry. Yeah. All good. And so they, and they said, well, we're not going to invest the 500 million with the FDA. We can't do it now. It would probably, we were looking at it. The financial crisis hit, they lost the money, right? They didn't have the stock, right? So they couldn't invest in this. And we even said, okay, but we did in that phase, that study, is we found a very strong improvement, very strong, way over placebo on social anxiety. Like we did the Leibovitz social anxiety scale, those people on the active medicine at way like P of 0.01, strongly less socially anxious than placebo, right? So the, but because the, GABA, of the GABA driven PAGA clone, what was exciting about it was perhaps on helping people reduce the social anxiety impact, which was yeah. something that exacerbates the physical manifestation stuff. Was that the thought? The thought? Yeah, exactly. Right. And but here, that's not we, we would, but that's not what we thought. Right. That's not what we thought at first. You know, uh, we thought when we did the study, we the FDA said pick one thing. If you meet it, your medicine's approved, right? We picked percent syllable study, right? It was a big discussion. It was 2007, right? We were just developing oases. And Gary, you didn't invite me to the call. I would have, I would have told you to bank on the social anxiety. I know. Right? Well, I pushed for it as well. So at least I included, I included the metric. I was talking to Scott. We included it, but it was secondary, right? So per the FDA, what we'd have had to do, done is do one more study with that social anxiety as a primary. I'm and feeling, we would have got it. I'm feeling the disappointment you have. Over no, over but let me tell you here, but it's also a problem in our world's drug development pipe, right? Yeah. You're seeing it at the COVID vaccine level. I'm just going to put it out there, right? Oxford University comes up with a vaccine, right? But they can't develop it because they don't have the mil hundreds of millions of dollars to go through the regulatory in Europe and the US to file all this stuff. It's hundreds of millions of dollars to do these studies. So they got to go with a big pharma, right? Even though the university develops it, it's what it is, right? You're seeing it with COVID. They go with AstraZeneca. Other people are going with Pfizer. You're going with Johnson & Johnson, these big pharma. And then you get people with money involved. And they say, you know what? We're not going to invest in that because we're not going to put the 500 million because we probably only get 700 million back in sales in five years, right? So what happens in our drug development is it's money driven. It's not science driven. We have to change that. We had a great product here, but I couldn't get someone to invest the hundreds of millions of dollars to get that approved. So among it's other things that Jerry's going to shake up is the entire way that drugs are developed and approved. But back to our GABA. And our <laughs> yeah, you got it. I know, right. So, okay. So that's why it ended, right? So the GABA social anxiety, dopamine is here. I'm, I'm going to show you one more slide. Activates that switch. We're going to go there, right? So we did so these studies. Just to finish that previous slide, Jerry, and to tie it back to what you said before, different subtypes. So for those who have very significant social anxiety, the pagaclone yeah. may have been a drug to consider. Of course, there were side effects and all kinds of other considerations that need to be brought in. But there are those who don't have much social anxiety. Right. It might not be indicated for them. Would that be correct? You got it. Yes. Right. Okay. I'm sending a text about my next meeting. I'm not yeah, there right no now. Problem. I'm got sorry it. to keep so you. No, this you is, got this. Is good. It. For people that really want to wrap their head around it, you're getting the best explanation possible, and it's exciting next-gen stuff. Got it. We're going to do that, right? So you got it. So GABA, right? Okay, we're going to go there, right? Then we also study the people who stutter or dopamine levels are, are, are more active. We show that, right? So good. Right, we're going to go here, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to publish these data, right? Um. What we're showing is risperidone, which is a compound um, like olanzapine, kind of like ecopipam, but a different receptor, right? We studied people in a blinded fashion 
off the, before they were on the medicine and after, right? And what do we show on treatment? They didn't know they were on treatment or whatever. This is a left side image. Bingo, straight up oh. higher. That's it, right? So we actually show a mechanism there as to why these medicines might work. So what it also shows here is therapy helps that. Because you're yeah. going to get that other speech and you're going to help that straight and work better. You're also going to show acceptance is the real key, right? No one will accept. They're not mutually exclusive. Understanding avoidance, getting beyond avoidance, acceptance. And I will say this, understanding stuttering, having a biologic basis with a neurophysiologic will protect us more from discrimination and stigma and bring us into greater acceptance with society right? Because what society is saying, just relax. There's something wrong in here. You know, you're just a nervous guy. You can't do this job, but right? you have poor verbal communication skills. But by being listed as a protected disability and being listed as a brain disorder will really fight people from discriminating against us. Because what I want to change to is a young physician. I know young physicians unfortunately, Uri, who haven't passed that exam. Because the medical licensing community says, well, you have to speak in 30 minutes. It's a requirement to be a physician. And if you can't do it, you can't do the job. Wait a minute, they accommodate other people. If someone's in a wheelchair, they're not gonna make that person stand and do a surgery, right? So they understand it because this guy's got a spinal cord injury with us. They say, no, this guy can't do it. He's a defective human being or whatever. I'm, I hate that term, but that's what my medical community says. You have to speak fluently, right? I want to so my image. Yeah, so, Go ahead, finish right. your- I'm gonna, gonna say the image. So what I have to say to bring my neurodiversity friends in, I'm with you, right? The, I'm, if they, I, I joined NSA, NSP acceptance, right? We grow, we, these are all together. We are inclusive. We understand that it's a stuttering community. All of us are together. It's parents, it's grandparents, it's my therapist growing up as a kid who I saw from second grade to today um, who've helped me. We're all part of one collective community. We can't be um, exclusionary. Where, why should we people who stutter exclude and bully people who don't? Just because we were excluded and bullied as kids, we're gonna give it back. We're one people. We are inclusive. I wanna go politically, but we need to unite don't, in this world. Don't. I won't, but I gotta tell you, I wanna tell you, but we gotta unite. There's too much I wanna say this. So yeah. would you say, I wanna ask you two yeah. questions, get your response and I'll yeah. get you off. I know you gotta run. Yeah. One, would you say that uh, things like cognitive behavioral therapy, yes. uh, acceptance commitment therapy, ACT, yeah and different types of mindfulness exercises and other things of that sort, do those things have the capacity to change the brain, to retrain the brain, to re recreate and strengthen and weaken different connectivity that starts getting hot? Not only is it my opinion, it's proof. I will show you now here, I'm gonna tell you the data here. So right? just, I just wanna make the yeah. statement that you're thought of as the pharmacology guy, as the pill guy, but not only are you saying, look, it's nice to complement medicine with therapy. What you're saying is good therapy can affect changes in the brain in the way the brain functions and so however you start off you've got a tendency to go there but you can do quite a bit to retrain and rewire the brain i'm going to show you why right i'm going to show you why right my pharmacology research that gets the press right my pharmacology treatment you know that's the atlantic that's the, you know, that's, that's, the that's the smithsonian magazine right when i come up with that like wait this guy's got a pill for stuttering I'm way more than that, right? But because that doesn't meet, you know, the Google alert. That's right. That, you know, he's a pill guy, right? I'm an nsa -er. I was an nsp -er. I am an acceptance. I'm self-help. I'm therapy. Still, you're I'm still the guy that read the paper you weren't supposed to look at, and you're still trying to be a champion for those that are still in You that got it. So door. here that is, right? But I'm doing the genetics work as well, right? I'm, but brain tissue, we're working, I'm working Shelly Joe and we're working together, imaging, we got that Scott, we're doing this, because they have skill sets I don't have. But I'm the only licensed MD, I think, in the world 
who's really looking at biologic treatments for stuttering. It's me. And that's why it's so good to see you so many pounds later and looking so healthy. You got it. But I now, will tell last, you. No, yeah, I just I got it. Yeah, okay. No. okay. Yeah. Okay. The so last, you're telling me about that. Okay. But I want to say this here. The change in the brain. Mindfulness. From yeah, you got yeah. it. Mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, change the brain. And I'll tell you where we need to be, right? Where we need to be here. I'm going to bring a thing here. In 1991 or so, right, a biologic treatment came out for obsessive compulsive disorder. It was called clomipramine, right? And then later, a couple of years later, fluoxetine or Prozac gets approved, right? People had OCD, right, for years, right? They never got treatment. They, would, they never went out because they thought there was no hope. They were just burdened in their own homes, touching objects, couldn't leave their home, couldn't go see a therapist or nothing. Suddenly a pill comes out that it could help, right? So that gets people out. There's a big education campaign. If you have OCD, you could be helped, right? So suddenly, right, millions of people around the world. I bet you in 1991, people didn't even know what OCD was. There was no acronym for OCD. It was hidden in the literature as obsessive compulsive disorder, right? No one, people back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, said, God, this guy's weird. He touches things. Yeah, okay, for instance, Howard Hughes, Howard Hughes, right? Trivia. He had severe OCD, right? You look back, right? He had, you, know, you, you look at the movie The Aviator, right? He's washing his hands, right? He's touching things. He is so severely OCD, right? He locks himself in a hotel room for the rest of his life, doesn't even see anybody. He died a recluse because of OCD. Really, I, I've never met him, but look at the story, right? He couldn't even talk about it because there was no treatment. No one even knew what he had. Later, a pill comes out, right? And people say, God, I got that. That's me. I touch things all the time. I can't leave my house. So they go to a doctor and that doctor says, you know what? This pill can only do so much. You got to go to therapy too. So they start going to therapy again because they really understand like cognitive behavioral therapy can really help this and mindfulness can help it, right? So then the doctors and the psychologists and the therapists are working together. And then so we show an effect that the mill, the pills, Prozac, whatever, help a region of the brain called the cingulate in one way, right? And then they show cognitive behavioral therapy does that too. And then they showed that both of them together work better, right? You really help if you're doing cognitive behavioral and mindfulness in OCD, it makes the medicines work better and vice versa. And they showed that with imaging scans. So you know what? I'm talking to someone right now. Dr. Anzo and others, right? We're going to do studies which look at medicine, therapy alone, yep. and medicine and yep. therapy. Scott yep. and I have talked about that. And I bet you it's going to be that third arm that's going to work better. And so what's going to happen in three years, the model of stuttering will be, yep, you get your therapy, you get your self-help. And you know, for those of you, if this is type, 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 you get medicines too, but it's not going to be mutually exclusive. People with OCD right now is accepted. You can't fire anybody if he touches objects, right? If this person's got to get time off from work or extra time to complete a task. For instance, I treat a doctor with OCD. He is the best radiologist in the world. And this guy looks at a film. He looks at every little detail, right? Every little detail. You want him looking at your chest x-ray because as he sees a little splotch, He's going to pick it up where the other guy puts the film up for three seconds and puts it down. This guy is so detail oriented, but the hospital was saying he's not reading films fast enough. He's not generating enough revenue. Like he can't, right? He's so obsessive to the, that's why he's a great radiologist. He thing. has to look at his civilian, right? The pill tape, but he's good at it. So I had a file as an accommodation to that hospital. You know what? Pay him the same amount just because you're paying people to read films. He's doing a better job. You got to accommodate him that instead of reading a chest x-ray in three minutes, he takes 10 minutes, right? But he does the better job. So you got to pay him the same. It's a work accommodation. He's doing well. They had to modify it because it's a diagnosable disability, right? So they there, understood the it. Diagnosis and disorder was helpful to get him that accommodation, keeping him the job. You got it. And they can't fire him, right? That's and right. how he gets treatment today is medicine and therapy. Right? What, He's doing last okay. question. What do you want yeah. to see from me in the next three to five years? What can I do to help move this Good. ball forward? Good. What you're doing now, educating the world. What I want to do too is what you and I have in common, uniting the world, 
acceptance, avoidance, and interdisciplinary care. We've shared clients. This is what it's all about. It's not get a pill here. It's not get therapy here. It's together across discipline, speech, language, pathology, psychology, psychiatry, educate the world. Just don't pick up a pill. I don't care. Even if it's one FDA approved, just don't do that. See a therapist too. If you, you're, you're, your, your speech language pathologist will be the primary clinician, but I want the understanding of the speech language pathologist to say, like many of my colleagues do, yeah, I think you could benefit from a medication. Go see this. This guy. conversation is moving that forward. I think we need to yeah. recognize speech therapy for stuttering is in need of a big upgrade. And, and you're at the forefront among so many others that I'm having these conversations with and more moving it forward. And certainly in the times we're living in, making it more available to more people in the world. So this conversation couldn't have happened at another time. Thank you for taking the time. Where I hope to be is right here with yep. you. Wonderful. That's good. We're going to take a walk. We're going to take a walk again together. Very we'll take a walk. And you know what? I've lost 40 pounds since then, man. So I got to get new, uh, new clothes. I don't know if I'll be able to keep up with you. I don't know if I'll be no, able to keep up. Good. I, won't say, I won't say who, but someone was on this call with me. They have the opposite experience as you. They told me they haven't put on a pair of pants because all their appointments are on Zoom. All their lectures are on Zoom. They haven't put on a pair of pants. If they tried to, it probably wouldn't fit because their waistline got has. I got to tell you, as a doctor, right? COVID is all over the place. It's brought us challenges, we'll say, right? There's going to be some good things to actually come out of it. And that is one, uniting the world around this, right? Getting everybody together. That's one. Number two, I want us all to focus on our own well-being. This yeah. is a doctor, right? Fortunately, I've had kind of a time to say, okay, instead of me driving in a car, eating crappy, even you think you're getting healthy fast food at a sandwich shop or something, there's still more calories. And if you get something better yourself. I think it's really, that's a part of it too. I'm not on the run, right? I'm able to walk my dog. It's not just the pill. It's a, the change in diet. It's the exercise. It's a time where I'm not sitting in a car, sitting in meetings, driving myself. It's like, focus on yourself, focus on your family, right? And then make sure your time in the COVID to get that exercise, eat the right stuff, right? If a lot of this me, stuff, if, yeah. If you let, and that's part of it too, right? Yeah, yeah, you save time on the commutes. You're saving time, right. but all of us are feeling it gets eaten up if we don't deliberately grab that time, carve it out to put in some right. good habits. And if you're home stuck with your family and everyone's ripping each other's heads off, that's understandable and normal. I had a wonderful friend I invited to do this conversation. He turned me down. I was a little bit shocked at first because he's a good friend. And then he told me, I'm just a little overwhelmed. I'm Mr. Mom. Got it. So let me tell you, there's a couple things here, right? I'm a kids. psychiatrist too. I'm a psychiatrist too. This is not just this is stuttering off the record. stuttering record. Uh, the stuttering, I'm just telling this thing, right? What people do, what I've done, what I've done, I run a department. I've got 150 employees, right? I put together and I said this, you know, this is it. No meetings before nine o'clock. Your workday was eight to five. No meetings before nine. Nothing after four, right? And every meeting going forward is not to the full hour. It's 10 to 15. It's like, if like it's a nine o'clock meeting, the this breaks right. all the rules. Right. The meeting is nine to 9.50. No more hour long meetings. No right. more half hour meetings or 20 minutes. And we go into Zoom, you click your meeting, it's 9, 9.30. Just okay. click the end date 10 minutes earlier. That allows you time to go grab a cup of coffee, use the restroom, talk to your kids, whatever. What's happened in America and all the world is we're back to back. And when we were in commuting, which was some positive, you had a little bit of downtime. You go in your car, you can think about it, what things like yep. that. You're walking to work. We're not walking to work. So we got to bring back a couple of things, benefits. That is block time. Talk to your boss, everything. We're doing a lot of this work on workplace. You need a couple hours outside of Zoom and email to go for a walk. And That's for right. the families, you're all over each other. Dynamics work on the positives. That may mean someone's in this part of the house, someone's in this part of the house get some time away, go for a walk, go for a walk with the family, get out of the house, right? Be together in a non-stressful environment. And with your coworkers, just don't send 80 friggin' emails every day. So I just want to know from the ride we had in the car two years ago, have you bought into my idea of Asana or you still do everything on email? We are, okay. In fact, the meeting I'm at right now, I'm supposed to be in is a workflow management meeting. So we, okay, we bought into Asana, which is great. 
we're using it thanks to you. Here was California there. Now they're switching to Microsoft Teams, and that's the meeting going on right now. Is right. there some sort of the what it is? I think it's because of all the security stuff. Well, the key the key is you can't manage your life with emails because it's basically other people's priorities in your face. But just one tip I have for families that are on top of each other: we started with the headphones. When kids can be on headphones, they're going to concentrate and learn better in the meetings they're in and not hear the noise and distractions around and vice versa. Everyone should have a good pair of headphones at home and some corner of the house that's like their space, their little pod, whatever, however you create that in whatever small space right. you have, everyone should have a little space that's their private spot. If you can so do what, that. Exactly. So what I'm doing is I'm putting in a covered patio, right? It'll be because right now my daughter's at home from college. Our mother-in-law lives with us. My wife, it's like, we're all in this, this place, right? So I'm getting a little space where they get their space. It'll be kind of like my remote office. Those in the US right now, I talk to my tax, this is a tax deduction because I don't, I'm not an IRS guy, talk to your accountant, but because I'm mandated, I got emails from work, you gotta work from home. Basically, I mean, it's pretty clear you're in a bedroom. Um, it's, yeah, that's it, right? I've got the background going, so you have no idea where I am because I'm too yeah. tucked in to want to show my mess. But Jerry, I just want to thank you. You're over time. Hey, thank you. Hey guys, but anytime, Mary, I'll see you together, man. We'll uh great seeing you. You're you're wonderful. I thank you all. Thanks to the stuttering community. We're all together. Right? Jerry, we're all together. I treasure, thank I treasure you. the connection because you continue to do good things together and uh, we'll keep our Zoom meetings in the future shorter than this one, but I cherish no, the it's good. Time. All right. Take care, guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Harry. Bye-bye.